In this segment and the next few, we're going to focus on a type of reaction referred to as an elimination reaction. An elimination reaction is a reaction where, as the name implies, something is removed from the molecule during the course of the reaction, or in other words, eliminated from the molecule during the course of the reaction. To be more specific, what's going to happen during an elimination reaction is that two substituents are going to be removed from the starting material, and due to their removal, the final product is going to end up with a carbon-carbon double bond so that all of the atoms are able to have an octet even after that group, those groups are lost. So let's take a look at the elimination reaction, the general reaction that's going to go on for elimination. What we're going to see in the different elimination reactions that we look at is we're going to start with a molecule that has a leaving group bonded to it. So I'm going to go ahead and just make a cyclohexane ring with a leaving group that is bonded there. I'm also going to go ahead and fill in the implied hydrogen atoms at both of these carbons so that we can keep track of everything as we go on. What's going to happen is that that molecule that's bonded to a good leaving group, and remember that a good leaving group is one that is generally a relatively electronegative atom. And those electronegative atoms are typically going to be things like halogen atoms are very good leaving groups because once the halogen has broken away from the molecule, much like we saw in the nucleophilic substitution reaction, the reaction product halogen anion is very stable because those atoms are very electronegative. So electronegative atoms tend to make very good leaving groups here where LV is our leaving group. So we'll take a molecule that has a good leaving group bonded to it and we'll react it with a base. And I'm going to go ahead and put the base here in blue and abbreviate it as B dot dot for a lone pair of electrons there. That's going to act as our base. Remember that bases, by definition, are going to be molecules that are able to abstract a proton from the other reactant. They're able to grab a proton during the course of this reaction using their lone pair of electrons. And that's what makes this fill the definition of a base. Bases are very commonly anions. That's not always the case, but bases are very often anions. And so what's going to happen in this reaction is that the base is going to remove a proton from the molecule. So for example, this proton will be removed by a base. In addition, the leaving group leaves from that adjacent carbon atom. And as an outcome of this, so that both of those two carbon atoms that have lost a proton or a leaving group will still have an octet, we're going to put a carbon-carbon double bond in between those two atoms. So the final product here is going to have a carbon-carbon double bond located there at between the carbon where the leaving group left and the adjacent carbon where we lost a proton. So we would end up with this as a product of our reaction, as well as we mentioned that the base is going to grab that red circled proton from the organic reactant. So we'd also have the conjugate acid that results from that, where the base has grabbed that proton. And remember again that that proton is the proton that was circled in red on the left-hand side of the equation, so I'm circling in red on the right just to keep track of it. And then the other product of this reaction is going to be that leaving group that has broken away. So we'll just put LV dot dot to indicate it's going to take the two electrons from the covalent bond over here on the left with it when it goes and therefore it's going to pick up an extra lone pair of electrons. Very often it will have a formal charge as well. This is going to be the general crux of what's happening during an elimination reaction. So one thing that you may be thinking as you're looking at this elimination reaction, is you may be thinking, oh gosh, these reactants look very similar to what we saw in the nucleophilic substitution reaction. And you are absolutely right if that's what you were thinking. The reactants here are indeed very, very similar to what we saw in a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So these reactions are generally in direct competition with one another, the substitution reaction, the elimination reaction. And we're gonna learn some things in later segments about what we can do to drive the reaction to favor substitution or favor elimination. But for now, what we're gonna look at is a focus on elimination reactions. So just to, to contrast that with the substitution reactions, as a reminder here, of our earlier material. In the substitution reaction, what happened was that if we had 
a molecule that was bonded to a leaving group, just like the structure up top here that was our organic reactant, we would have, rather than what we were referring to as a base, we would have instead what we were referring to as a nucleophile. Nucleophiles and bases are often very similar in terms of their structures. So we'd have our nucleophile come in, and the difference often between a base and a nucleophile is just what role that molecule is playing in the reaction. So the nucleophile, by definition, is going to attack a carbon atom or form a bond to a carbon atom is what we mean when we say that it attacks. So the nucleophile is going to attack a carbon atom by definition. On the other hand, the base that we saw up top here, the role that a base will play is that it is going to attack a proton. It's going to grab a proton from the other reactant. And so looking at these two reactions, they are certainly in competition with other, where the substitution reaction at the bottom is going to cause a replacement of the leaving group with the nucleophile, because remember that substitution basically means to replace. So the nucleophile is going to substitute in or replace the leaving group like so, leaving group will have left, so we'll put LV dot dot. So really the difference between these two reactions is what's going on in terms of whether the molecule that has the lone pair of electrons is acting as a base up top, meaning it's grabbing a proton to give a so-called elimination reaction, or whether that molecule is acting as a nucleophile, meaning that it's attacking the carbon atom and therefore doing a substitution reaction or replacement reaction instead. So for now, we'll leave it at this, that those two reactions do compete with one another. And we'll save the discussion for a little bit later on after we know about the mechanisms of elimination to discuss some of the features that will cause elimination reactions to be favored over substitution or vice versa. But for now, at this very moment, we're going to focus on elimination reactions. So elimination reactions, what we're going to see is that they come in two different mechanisms. The two mechanisms for elimination reactions that we're going to focus on in detail in the next couple of segments are what are referred to as the E1 and E2 reaction mechanisms. So the mechanisms of elimination are the so-called E1 mechanism and E2 mechanism. Much like nucleophilic substitution reactions had two different mechanisms that could go on in order to give a substitution reaction, we called those SN1 and SN2, E1 and E2 are the two mechanisms of elimination. And if we take a look at, just to get started on talking about the elimination reaction mechanisms, the E1 reaction mechanism, what we're going to see is that the one there indicates that the rate limiting step, the slowest step of the mechanism process is unimolecular. And specifically that unimolecular rate determining step, the slowest step of the mechanism is the step that involves only the molecule that's bonded to the leaving group. So the rate, in other words, is dependent on only the concentration of the molecule that's bonded to the leaving group. So put R, LV, where R is whatever alkyl group is bonded to the leaving group. That's going to give us the rate. So the rate of this reaction is dependent only on the concentration of the molecule that's bonded to the leaving group, much like when we were looking at nucleophilic substitution reactions, the SN1 reaction also had an identical rate limiting step where the rate limiting step was the step in which the carbocation was formed, the step where the leaving group broke away from the rest of the molecule, giving a carbocation. We're gonna see the same thing is true for an E1 reaction mechanism, that the rate limiting step is indeed the step where a carbocation forms. So the rate determining step of an E1 reaction is the carbocation formation, where the leaving group breaks away in order to give a carbocation. We can envision that intuitively as a rate limiting step because we think of it as a process that's giving way to a, quite a bit of instability in the reaction relative to what we started with. We start with a molecule that's bonded to a leaving group, relatively stable. We go to the product of that step being a carbocation. Carbocations are 
relatively unstable since they have that positive formal charge on the carbon. Um, then from there, what's going to happen is that the E1 reaction mechanism will diverge from SN1 in order to give that elimination, to give the formation of the carbon-carbon double bond that we see in the product. The second mechanism for elimination is the so-called E2 reaction mechanism. And in the E2 reaction mechanism, the number two there indicates to us that the rate determining step is bimolecular. And the bimolecular rate limiting step involve, is going to involve the base coming in and grabbing a proton at the same time the leaving group leaves, much like with the SN2 reaction where the nucleophile came in and attacked the carbon at the same time the leaving group was leaving. So the rate for an E2 reaction is going to be equal to K, the rate constant, times the concentration of the molecule that's bonded to the leaving group times the concentration of the base, which I'll put B and then that lone pair of electrons on it. So that rate equation is going to look pretty much just like the SN2 rate equation, except that we're calling the base a base rather than referring to that as a so-called nucleophile. And we're referring to it as a base again just because of what it's doing in the reaction. What it's doing is attacking a proton, thereby making it fit the definition of base, whereas in the nucleophilic substitution, the SN2 reaction, we were thinking of it as attacking a carbon, and so we're referring to it as a nucleophile instead. What we're going to do in the next few segments is look in more detail at the E1 and E2 reaction mechanisms for carrying out elimination. We'll go through step by step how each of these mechanisms work to illustrate what we're seeing as these rate equations. We'll also do some more to compare and contrast nucleophilic substitution and these elimination reactions.